Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr. Gerin. Today we're going to look at the Sun, but of course not with our unprotected eyes. We'll discuss the structure of the Sun, the nuclear fusion that powers it, and how its energy gets from the Sun's core to us and the rest of the universe. We'll also look at sunspots, what they are, and how they form. The Sun's interior is made of four main parts. The core is where the nuclear fusion that powers the Sun takes place. It's about 20-25% to of the Sun's radius, with extreme pressures and temperatures as high as 15 million Kelvin. Past that is the radiative zone. Here, the energy produced in the core is radiated away to the outer layers. Temperatures range from 7 million Kelvin next to the core to a low of 2 million Kelvin at its outer edge. Next, we have the convective zone. Here, the plasma that makes up the Sun, more on that shortly, is too cool to allow radiation to work well, at only 2 million Kelvin in its inner parts and a chilly 5,800 Kelvin at the outer edge. Instead, convection cells form, taking hot plasma upward, depositing its heat at the top and travelling down again to collect more energy. And finally, for now, is the photosphere. This is the part of the Sun that we can see. The rest of this diagram is to scale, but the photosphere is so thin at only 100 kilometers, that I've made it large enough to see on this picture. The photosphere of our sun is 5,800 Kelvin, which gives it a white hot color. Of course, we see it as yellow, but that's because our atmosphere scatters the blue light across the whole sky. The sun is often said to be a burning ball of gas, but this isn't right. It gets its energy from nuclear fusion instead. Fusion means combining two or more things into one. Nuclear refers to just an atomic nucleus. The Sun is made mostly of hydrogen, which consists of one proton in the nucleus, plus one electron around it. These surrounding electrons repel each other, as they're both negative, preventing the protons at the centre of the atoms from reaching each other. However, the enormous temperatures in the Sun's core strip the electrons away from the protons. Atoms that have lost their electrons are ionised, and the Sun's core is composed of a fourth state of matter, hotter than solid, liquid or gas, called a plasma, ionised hydrogen and free electrons. This occurs at roughly 10,000 kelvins. Now the lone protons can reach each other. There are several fusion cycles that occur in the Sun, but you only need to know one of them. We start with two protons. Protons are positively charged and repel each other so we'll have to ram them together at very high speeds. We get these speeds because the Sun's core temperature is so high. Two protons meet, and one of them turns into a neutron. If you've studied A-level physics, you'll recognise this as an up quark turning into a down quark. The new nucleus formed is called hydrogen 2, as it has an atomic mass of 2, as opposed to the normal hydrogen 1. Hydrogen 2 is also called deuterium. Notice that hydrogen 2 has a charge of plus 1, but our two hydrogen 1 nuclei that we started with had a total charge of plus 2. One unit of charge has been lost, and this is carried away by a positron, a particle exactly the same as an electron, but with a positive charge. A neutrino is also created, but we can ignore that at GCSE. We haven't produced any gamma rays yet, but we have produced antimatter, a positron. When that positron meets one of the Sun's many electrons, they'll annihilate each other and release gamma rays, which are the energy we're looking for. We're not done yet. We're going to need another proton to add to our hydrogen 2 nucleus. These combine to form a nucleus with two protons. Element number 2 is helium. This nucleus also has one neutron, for a total atomic mass of 3, so it's called helium 3. This is also the only stage that directly releases gamma rays. Next, we're going to fuse two helium-3 nuclei, so we'll need to repeat the first two steps. When we slam these two together, we get a nucleus with the two neutrons we already created, plus two of the four protons. The other two protons are released, maybe to start again in a new fusion reaction. At the moment, the Sun goes no further, so helium-4 is building up in the core. This will change when it becomes a red giant in a few billion years, but I'll cover that in another video. Now earlier, I said that we need very high speeds for protons to fuse. This is because both protons are positive and repel each other. 
we need speeds sufficient to overcome their electrostatic repulsion. These speeds are so ridiculously high that we use temperatures of around 100 million kelvins in our Earth-based fusion reactors, such as ITER in France. At the Sun's core, with a temperature of only 15 million kelvins, fusion hardly ever happens. Most of the times, protons just bounce off of each other. But the Sun's core is huge, and has enormous pressures of around 300 billion times the atmospheric pressure of Earth, giving lots of opportunities for fusion to take place. It's like having trillions of lottery tickets. Almost all will lose, but you've still got a lot of winners. Even so, fusion in the Sun is very slow. And that's a good thing. If the Sun finished its fusion in a few years, there wouldn't have been time to form the planets, let alone life on Earth. So the core of the Sun is where nuclear fusion releases energy, in the form of gamma rays. These radiate outward. They continue to radiate through the radiative zone. But they don't go in a straight line. They are absorbed by a particle every few millimetres, and then re-emitted in a random direction. It takes tens of thousands of years to reach the convective zone. The convective zone is cool enough for atoms to form, and as we get further out there is less plasma and more gas. This absorbs the photons, which heat up the lower parts of the gas and form convection currents. It takes a week or two for these convection currents to transport energy to the photosphere. Finally, the photosphere is heated from below to about 5,800 kelvins. It releases the black body spectrum of radiation typical for that temperature, which we see as white light. The photosphere is the surface of the sun, the part we see. Since it's made of gas and plasma, you might expect it to be smooth, but it's very active. In this photo, you can see a large group of sunspots, as well as several smaller ones. This photo was taken during a solar eclipse, so don't worry that part of the sun seems to be missing. Here, we can see some sunspots close up. But first, notice the yellow granules in most of the picture. These are the tops of convection cells, each using convection currents to draw heat up through the convective zone. Hot gas rises in the bright middle of the cell, emits energy by radiation, cools, and falls down at the darker edges. The yellow colour is false colour, which shows the structure more clearly than white would. Sunspots are huge. Here's the Earth for comparison. There are two main parts of a sunspot, the inner dark part, called the umbra, and the outer, less dark part, called the penumbra. These are the same words we use to describe the shadows in an eclipse. The sunspots disrupt the convection cells, preventing heat from reaching them from below. This means they're much cooler. Only about 3,800 kelvins in the umbra, and around 5,600 kelvins in the penumbra. Cool enough for the umbra to appear black in this image. You may be asked to sketch the appearance of a sunspot in the exam. A simple labelled diagram like this one will do fine. So we've seen what sunspots are, but how do they form? As the plasma swirls around, the magnetic field on and just below the surface of the sun changes. Sometimes the magnetic field lines through the plasma get tangled up. This results in a very strong local magnetic field, and a pair of sunspots forms, one magnetic north pole and one magnetic south pole, which reduce convection and become cooler than the surroundings. This diagram shows a very simplified version. In reality, we can expect many sunspots to form in a group, with their magnetic field lines forming a tangled spaghetti-like mess. In this video, we can see some sunspots as they change over the course of an hour, as well as the shifting granules, or convection cells. You should now be able to answer this exam question. It's four marks, so you should make four clear points. Pause the video and give it a go. Here is the answer. The first is from the mark scheme, and the second is what I wrote. Sunspots only last a short time, a few days or weeks typically. In that time, they change shape, move across the surface of the sun, and may merge or interact with other nearby sunspots. Here we can see a sunspot group form and move across the sun over a period of two weeks. But why do they move from west to east? 
it turns out the sun is rotating, and we can use sunspots to track this and measure the sun's period of rotation. This video shows the whole sun for two weeks. Use this to estimate the sun's rotational period. Find a sunspot and track it for as long as possible, and note the date it appears and disappears, and how far across the sun it went in that time. You may want to rewind the video to try this twice. Hopefully you got around 20 to 25 days. If you got around 10 days, perhaps you forgot to multiply by 2 to include the other side of the Sun. Because the Sun has no solid bodies like the Earth's continents, it doesn't need to rotate all at the same speed. In fact, the poles take slightly longer to rotate, at 36 days, than the equator does, which takes 25 days. And finally, we're going to look at the solar cycle. While individual sunspots don't last long, new ones are created to take their place. But the total number of sunspots varies over time. This is called the solar cycle. This chart is called a butterfly diagram. It tracks the density of sunspots at different latitudes. We can see that the cycle starts with very few sunspots, then some appear far to the north and south, around 30 degrees. As the cycle progresses, sunspot formation moves towards the equator until it stops, and then the cycle repeats. This histogram tracks total coverage of the sun by sunspots. We can clearly see the maximum and minimum sunspot counts. Each cycle is numbered, with number 0 being back when we started tracking, in 1750. Pause the video now and use this graph to estimate the length of a solar cycle. The solar cycle is, of course, 11 years. That's it for now. The next two slides are a summary of what we've learnt today. In part two, we'll look at the sun's atmosphere, what it's made of, how it affects us, and how we can study it. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.